Hey students, it's Mr. Smeeds, and the end is almost here. The APES exam is coming up on Monday, and this is going to be our last review video of the year. We're going to be looking at specific FRQ skills. We're going to be practicing a couple FRQs and kind of fine-tuning our writing to head into that exam on Monday as confident as we can be. So we'll get right into it here. FRQ number one is going to be covering experimental design in some way. It's going to be 25 minutes to write, five minutes to submit, and the practice FRQs that have been put out are looking like there's going to be a full 10 points here. Um, so that's a full length FRQ. That's about the time that we took to write them uh, during class all year. And so really nothing new here, except for that we have to copy and paste it over from a Word document. So with experimental design, I would start here, even if it's not the first part of the FRQ. I think this is the easiest part of the FRQ. I think it should be the quickest. Uh, estimates look like it'll be about four to five points. So you want to get right into this and you may be asked to write a hypothesis. If you're going to have to write a hypothesis, they may ask you to write a hypothesis that tests a specific question or topic. So we have an example here. Write a hypothesis to test the effect that human activity has on ecosystem productivity. The first thing you want to do before you write a hypothesis is pick out your independent and dependent variable. They may even ask you for them later, so those may be points that you need to earn, but you need to have your IV and DV to write a hypothesis. So in this case, our independent variable is human activity because that's what's changing, that's what's having an effect on ecosystem productivity. Our dependent variable is ecosystem productivity. That's the outcome or the data we will collect to measure what that effect of human activity was. So I have some graphics here. Remember those IV and DV variables, very important. IV is what's changed or manipulated between the groups. DV is the data or the outcome. Sometimes I like to think I, the scientist, manipulate the independent variable. So you can remember that. Next, we want to think about our hypothesis. We have to phrase it in a very specific format to make sure we earn credit for apes. That is increasing or decreasing the IV will increase or decrease the DV. You do not want to make an if then because you do not need to make a prediction. Keep it simple. And so in this case, we would say forests with higher levels of human disturbance will have lower primary productivity. Then we have our groups. You will likely be asked to identify the groups that you're using in your experiment. And in every APE scoring guide that I've ever seen on an FRQ, you need at least three groups to earn credit. You need one control group and you need more than one experimental group. So two or more experimental groups. Remember the control receives no independent variable or the independent variable is held at a natural or baseline level. So this little graphic shows us that if we wanted to see how biofertilizer X works, our experimental groups, there should really be many there, would have different levels of biofertilizer X, but our control would not receive biofertilizer X. We need to compare the growth of these plants that get the fertilizer with plants that just get water, that don't get fertilizer. So in the example though that we've been working with in ecosystem disturbance, we could say forests with no human disturbance would be the control group. And then we would have a forest that has hiking and biking, That'd be kind of like a medium level of disturbance. And then we have a forest that has logging. That would be heavy human disturbance. So there are our three groups. And that kind of covers what we would need to do for a procedure. If you're going to design a procedure, you would definitely need three groups, one control and two experimental. You would need to describe how the IV is changing. So you could describe that one forest is left uh, you know, unaltered or you find a forest that has not had human disturbance and then one forest with a low level and one with a high level. And then finally, you should say something about the specific description of measuring the DV. So you could state that we're going to measure primary productivity in grams of carbon biomass growth per meter squared per year. So you want to be kind of specific about how the dependent variable is collected, how those data are measured. The other half of the experimental design FRQ, it, lo it looks like will include explaining environmental concepts, and then potentially proposing or describing a solution. Now we know we'll definitely have to propose and justify a solution in the second FRQ. So we'll go into more depth about how to do that shortly. First for explaining though, because this exam is open note, uh, most APES teachers have kind of speculated there will probably not be easy identify or simple describe points. 
It's possible you may describe something, but they probably expect a fair bit of depth, again, since it is open note. And so what I want you to do is be sure that you explain your explain prompts with a full three sentences. So go into depth. They're not going to give you easy points. They're not going to give you simple recognition points. You're going to need to focus on step-by-step -step answers. So when you explain something, there are usually three key details that should be a part of your answer. Focus on the how and the why. Focus on the cause and the effect. So walk the reader through the process you're describing, through the effect you're describing, through the problem you're describing. Start at the beginning with whatever process or phenomenon or concept is responsible for your answer and take them through it step by step. If you're writing less than three sentences, fewer than three sentences for an explain prompt, you're cutting it kind of close. Uh, if you're going to use two sentences, they should be really fully developed sentences. And I would push you to make sure that you go towards the range of three sentences for explain. For propose or justify a solution, like I said, we'll go into this with more depth shortly because the second FRQ will definitely feature this. It's possible to see it on the first. Um, if you're going to propose a solution, make sure it's specific. You may be asked to justify it. You may be asked to say, here's a disadvantage of my solution. Here's an advantage of solution. Be sure that you're talking specifically about the harmful effects that come with the disadvantage. You know, don't just say it's harder to do or cost more money. Be a little bit more specific than that. What are the harmful effects or why does it, you know, have the impact that you're saying it has? Then if you're going to talk about an advantage, talk specifically about the harmful environmental impacts that it avoids or that it reduces or that it mitigates. So be sure you're specific. You know, you don't want to just say that reducing car emissions are good for the environment because it's better air quality. We need to target a specific pollutant if you're going to propose, you know, stricter emission standards. So be specific. That's really what it all comes down to for both explain and for justify. The exam is open note this year, so they expect you to be super detailed. They're not going to give you a point for just surface level identify or describe answers most likely. Now we have a practice FRQ here. This was recently released by College Board. It looks like this is probably the closest simulation that you can get to what the actual exam will look like on Monday. And so I divided it into two halves. The first half here is the experimental design half. So that's five points and you, you would have 15 minutes to work on that. And then if we look here, the second half is here. So you've got a diagram that you have to make some reference to. That's another five points and that would be another 15 minutes. Remember you have 30 total minutes for this exam, but that includes your five to submit your answer. Like I said earlier in the video, I highly recommend copying and pasting from a Google doc. I've heard students have had the best success with that. And that also gives you the most time to write. So you don't have to spend time downloading a file and searching for it. What I want you to do is find the Google doc link that's in the description below here, open that up, and then you can write these two FRQs on your own time. I highly suggest though that you use these timers that are built in because you really wanna know what's your pacing like. Do I have time to quickly look up a definition that I'm not sure about? Do I have time to try to find some key details to beef up one of my explain answers? You don't wanna go into Monday never having kind of put yourself on the clock and tried using your reference materials mid-exam. It could be that you just don't think you're gonna have time to flip through your book and find the details that you need. So you wanna practice it a couple times first to decide if that's a realistic strategy for you on the exam on Monday. After you've written that, there is a great video walkthrough here by a veteran apes teacher, um, I think Scott Sowell, he's a guy from Florida and he contracted with College Board to actually do their YouTube review series. So he has an awesome video where over 12 minutes, he will break down all of the points that were available on that FRQ. Um, he's a really great teacher. So go check out his video and you can self score your FRQ. So check that out and see how you did. All right, the second FRQ is going to involve analyzing an environmental problem. You're going to have 15 minutes to write, five to submit, so 20 total minutes. And it looks like from the most recent practice that College Board has put out that this is going to be eight total points. That's a bit of a squeeze. You may not finish all eight points, but remember not to panic. Uh, Trevor Packer, the head of the AP program, has said time and time again, you may earn a four or five without answering every single letter. I think that they've probably built in more points than they actually expect you to earn. 
And so do not panic if you don't make it to every single one of those points. Remember quality over quantity. Really make sure that you're providing solid three sentence answers for all of your explains, that you go into detail, that you're going step by step. Don't rush to get to the last couple letters. Really take your time and make sure you earn all the points that you're attempting. That's the key here, quality over quantity. So on the second FRQ, we know for sure you will be analyzing an environmental problem. So what I have here are three possible stimuli that they may give you, meaning three things that they're gonna give you and ask you to reference as you analyze the problem. They could give you data. They could also give you a diagram and we'll see an example of that shortly, but they could give you a short passage or text. If they give you data, I've told my students this all year, if they give you data, they expect you to use it. They expect you to reference the data. They don't just put a chart in there for you to look at and go, oh, cool, some numbers. No, they expect you to use the data. So you have to reference the data. For example, if they're going to show a graph of a decline in a fish population, you have to reference those data. You've got to say that from you know 1995 to 2005, the fish population declines from 12,000 individuals to 2,000 individuals or you could give the percent change if you want, but you have to reference the data. Again, if they give you these data, you've got to assume they're there for a reason, and that reason is that you use them in your answer. Um, for the diagram, you want to make sure you refer to specific processes, effects that are in the diagram. Pay attention to the direction of the arrows and the labels. Um, a lot of my students recently mistook decomposition as adding carbon back to the soil, which you know, is a potentially feasible answer for talking about some of the organic matter they break down, returning to the soil and being buried. But the answer the College Board was looking for was that decomposition adds carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And if you look closely at the diagram, you'll see that there's an arrow going from decomposition and respiration up into the atmosphere. So that clearly must be CO2. And this is just something that's super important. If they give you a diagram, really pay close attention to labels and arrow directions. And then finally, if they give you text, I would read, read it, go through twice, make sure that you've looked very carefully at it. And then when you explain an environmental problem based on that text, make sure that you are giving it the right frame. Now, we think it's going to be environmental because that's what they've said, but if they ask you to describe something that's an ecological problem, focus a little bit more narrowly on organisms and their interactions. It doesn't sound like they're going to be asking you for an economic problem, but just be prepared for that. If they were to throw in economic, you need to reference money, you need to reference revenue. So we're not talking about environmental quality anymore. So if we look at this little graphic here reminding us what to do on an explain prompt, I have a little guy walking up steps because I really want to reinforce that you have to go in a step-by-step -step process on these explain answers. You want to focus on the why and the how. Why is this an environmental problem? What process or concept causes this problem. And then I have the one, two, three in here because usually there are three key components required to earn a point on an explain answer. So you can look at that example I have there, uh, but you'll also see examples of these if you watch the scoring videos that these other AP teachers have provided later on. Then the last portion of the propose and justify a solution FRQ will be just that, propose and justify a solution. On the practice FRQs, it's been looking like this will be about three points. Now there's two big things to do when you propose a solution. Make it specific. You have to make sure you specifically address the problem and not just addressing the problem, but how does your solution address the problem? Focus specifically on the negative environmental outcome that is mitigated or reduced or alleviated with your solution. The other thing is it needs to be realistic, especially if you're gonna invoke a government-based solution, it needs to be realistic. Remember that the government generally does not ban things. They can, but it's generally not a best practice to use banning on an APES FRQ. They also can't raise or lower prices. The government can't call up BP and just say, raise your oil prices. It, our you know, government just doesn't function like that. The government can pass laws. So they could pass laws that make stricter emissions standards for factories and for vehicles. They could increase taxes to discourage an unwanted behavior. They could give tax subsidies or tax breaks if they want to encourage a wanted behavior. And then the other thing they can always do is provide funding for a public education campaign. That's a great go-to answer 
For a government-based solution, if you're unsure of what to do, they can always fund public education campaigns that try to get the public to change their behavior relative to a specific problem. So if we look at our little graphic here, just remember that you have to be really specific. You have to explain how your solution, again, alleviates or avoids some negative consequences. And then I have in red, you don't want to use ban. You don't want to say the government should encourage something. It's just too vague. Uh, you need to be specific. So use a tax code that could be changed, use an actual law, or you could say that the government can fund a public education campaign. So here we have practice FRQ number two. Uh, this is five points. You'll notice that there's only 10 points on this timer. And so that's because the second FRQ is going to be only 20 minutes total. So I have 10 minutes here for these five points. And then I have five for these last three. And that's to leave you that five minutes to kind of potentially look something up if you need to or copy and paste and make sure that you are all set and that you don't run out of time. Notice that there is a diagram here, so you should be specifically referencing the diagram in your answer. You also have a little bit of text above it, so you should read that quickly and reread it potentially. Make sure that you don't miss any details. And then for the second portion, this is where we're going to kind of propose a solution. So just make sure that your solution is very specific, that it's realistic, and that it directly addresses how it alleviates or reduces the environmental problem that it's aimed at. And if you click on this video link, uh, there's another great apes teacher that's going to explain the scoring for this point. You want to watch it from the 1939 mark through the 32 minute mark. And so she's going to break down exactly where all the points were awarded, show you the scoring guide. So again, that should really help as you think about, am I earning these explained points? Am I giving these three kind of facts and details I need? Am I walking my reader through step by step? So this is probably the single best thing you can do to try to fine tune your writing style before we get to that exam Monday. All right, everybody, thanks for watching this video. Um, I just have a quick reminder here of five important steps you should take before Monday at 3.30 Eastern time. If you're watching this somewhere else, make sure to look up your own time zone. But for Eastern time zone folks, the exam's at four, meaning you wanna check in at 3.30. And so first you need to make sure to find your AP ID and your e-ticket. If you look at these Google slides, remember those are in the description below. There are going to be links built into here to teach you how to find your AP ID if you're not sure yet. You can try the exam demo. I highly recommend that if you haven't taken an AP exam this year already. It's pretty straightforward, but it's just nice to be comfortable navigating it. And then you should definitely, definitely write and self-score those two practice FRQs in this video. Again, those are in the Google slides that are in the description below. I have timers built right in, so you could just set the timer and kind of pace yourself, see what it would feel like on that exam. And if you plan to use reference materials on the exam, your textbook or this reference sheet that's linked below, I recommend practicing doing that in a timed FRQ setting. So if you get to these practice FRQs and you're like, shoot, I really need to look up thermal inversion, you know, practice doing that with the clock running and see how much of your time does that eat up. It may be worthwhile if it earns you a point or two, but it may not be worthwhile if you waste time looking through it and still don't come away with a solid answer. Um, step four, you wanna make sure you study on your own or in some Zoom sessions this weekend. That's for Grand River students. There'll be some Zoom sessions. Uh, the schedule for those are going out at Remind Text and they're on Google Classroom. And that study link will take you to my channel where there's a ton of other videos content wise. And then the last thing you wanna do is make sure that your book and your reference sheet are ready to go on exam day, that you have them up, that you're comfortable flipping through the book, that you're comfortable scrolling through the reference sheet. Because if you do wanna take some of that precious time to look up information, you wanna make sure that you can do it very quickly. So those are my suggestions to make sure you're ready for this APES 2020 exam. It's a different kind of exam this year, one that puts all the emphasis on writing. So you already know that you have to think like a mountain, and more than ever, you've got to write like a scholar.